I still say I built the first aluminum steering wheel. At 13, I built one. And this guy walks by the car and he stops and he backs up, picks the steering wheel up and he's looking at it. And he pulled out a card, he handed it to me, he says, send me 30 up. Hi, I'm Johnny Benson and this is Derek. Ain't gonna happen. I ain't gonna be able to do it. I can barely say what, then, and where. <laughs> Hi, I'm Johnny Benson. Welcome to the Derek Pernisiglio Show. Can I you? Todd's doing a lot of the stuff now from the Fox Studios. Actually, that's not a bad gig because you're still doing TV stuff. You're on air, but you're not having to travel or, or anything like that. So. Well, that is true. I mean, that, that part's kind of cool. But uh, I was watching something I think that Dale Jr. said the other day. He says, I don't want to do TV if I'm just stuck in my hometown. If I'm going to do it, I might as well be there, yeah. which, which I do agree with that. So yeah. if you are going to do it, it, it is a catch-22. I think as a... Like the show when we did uh, Inside Winston Cup Racing, okay, that makes sense to do that in the studio. Mm -hmm. But I think for your broadcast in a live show, it's tougher. No, tougher I know. to not see what's going on because I have seen guys make mistakes on it. It's actually kind of funny because when you're when you're at the race doing the broadcast, you really got to look at the TV that people are watching at home because right. it does get confusing when we start to talk about something that's going on a track that they don't see and they're kind of like, "What are you talking about?" So. Sometimes doing the, the TV there, you're watching it like people at home to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. I, I get why they're doing it now. I mean, they're saving a ton on budget by doing by doing it remotely. They're saving on you know travel, rent a cars, you know things like that. I, I, I understand. It, it's not the same as being there. I, I know it, because I, I mean I traveled with the K and M Pro Series and the Modifieds for years. Uh, you know, uh, doing all of those races and and uh, you know I'm at the track. I was the only one who was boots on the ground, and then I would take all the footage back to uh, the you know the NASCAR Hall of Fame, and they would put the show together, and then they would voice it later in the week, and then have you know my re pit reports were edited into the show. You know, yeah. So that's you know and, as far and as and a I, lot of that makes sense too, though. But uh, I think if it's live, at least right. you think your main guys have to be there. Maybe the rest mm -hmm. of people can get away uh, doing the other. They're doing it more and more. And, and I've are. seen it, yeah, because I, I freelance sometimes at the Fox Studios, and I've done football over there, too. And the football guys will be in the studio, in the Fox Studios, doing, you know, a remote broadcast from Georgia or Tennessee or whatever. And Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. And, I and, and today they got so many cameras. As long as you can see what's going around, around yeah. you know, because it gives you something to think about, think, mm -hmm. to talk to. And I think that's at the race, like being in a booth. You still look around mm -hmm. and you want to see what's going on because something may have happened that caught on tape or they're not showing it at the moment. That they could go back and replay and show kind of what you're doing. But uh, I think that if you miss some of that, as far as, you know, the race itself in general, when it's live, you got to be able to see pit road. You got to see what's going mm -hmm. on without you know give you something to talk about yeah i, I get it because if you watch sometimes in the booth they'll pick their heads up over the the monitors and kind of <laughs> stick you know they're, they're yeah they'll stick their heads up looking around see what's going on and everything but when when you were driving like how hard of a, uh, of a schedule was it for you because um, you know you were running the cup car every weekend and then you'd have to come in and do inside winston cup because i i worked in those Stuart andrew boulevard uh buildings back in 2001 and i was a young pa back then i was you know just a gopher but I remember seeing you and Michael and Alan and, and you know, eventually Dave Despain would come in too sometimes. But uh, how big of a schedule was that for you guys? Because you had to get right back. It was it was a Monday show, right? Because they it's shot Monday, the, Monday at 11 o'clock. We would tape it right. and then it showed that night, obviously, it, at a 7. But. Okay. So, but was how hard of a, of a grind was that for you? That wasn't too bad because we wanted to be home anyway. So, we're oh, going to okay. be home Sunday night. You know, uh, you know, most everybody either leases a plane or has a plane. So, Getting home and getting to that show wasn't a big deal, except from the West Coast. But, um, but yeah, you get home, we drive down, and, you know, we just taped the show. Now, we had done a few live shows, mm -hmm. and we always laugh because it's our show. Mm -hmm. And so me, Mike, and Ken, and Kenny, and, and Alan, he understood TV stuff a lot more than we did. But um, we'd always laugh. and says, how come this is taking two hours? If it's live, <laughs> it only takes an hour. How come we can't do that? So... We started taping it like we were doing live, and uh, God, we we make mistakes and all that, and then it just got to the point where 
we didn't cover them up because the fans love that when we screwed up. That was what made, I think, made yeah. the show so genuine, too, because I would walk past the control room and hear the guys in there just rolling, laughing, <laughs> you know, at stuff. And and you and, and Kenny and Michael, you know, had just that chemistry between the three of you. It was, it, you know, it was funny because, you know, you had Kenny with his quick wit and then Michael with his, and then you were like the middleman. You were like the, the straight and narrow one down the middle, but you had your, your dry uh, sense of humor too. And then Alan, of course, with him being the moderator, just, yeah. <laughs> you guys just hit lightning in a bottle with that show. We, we laugh because we couldn't imagine Alan amazing job i mean he dealt with just about anything that we talked about he did a good job but like the producers in the back had to have been either shaking her head going how are we getting out of this we got to get our commercials in. we got to do all this stuff and sometimes they would you know obviously with tv they're they're going to give you okay we need to take a break here you know or but if they get in the middle of something good they'll hold it mm -hmm. and then they'll say well we're going to have to figure out how to fit our, our commercials in so there was a lot of that going on they let us kind of do what we what we did and i think that's its success was off that like we used to laugh because the garbage people would come in there and it was just beating the <laughs> heck out of that i was like we always thought that the people could hear it so we'd always make comment about it finally people said what are you guys talking about the mics are good enough it wasn't picking it up but right. we don't know how they weren't i know because or, the the garage door was right there for you guys it was I right remember. there ups yep. fedex and all them they would come in and we would we got to put we didn't even stop it ah, come on and we'll sign for you get out of here and it was it was so much fun to do that and yeah. give the uh you know the freedom for us to just really talk about what we wanted to a lot of it obviously had to go around to racing mm -hmm. and alan did a tremendous job with that part trying to get ready because i would always show up early sometimes i'd be 15 20 minutes early where the other guys they just kind of show up right and and alan be writing a show right then yeah and it's it's crazy that he would sit there he'd come in an hour or two later and write it and be just finishing as we start i know and he and would be flying back crazy. in some instances too so oh he's in the same travel yeah. problem we are and a lot well we'll leave the track way before alan did right you know when he's up in a booth i mean we we could you know that we get done boom we're out but mm -hmm. um he, he took a little longer but well it's funny that you're here today because it's garbage day out in front of the studio yeah, so perfect. You, you, may, <laughs> <laughs> you may hear a beep 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 so but uh actually lately um what do you call it I, I like to think you've been doing a lot of cool racing because you've been running a super modified a lot and uh that that's been that's been pretty fun and pretty awesome hasn't it uh, oh absolutely i mean I, I love racing i do a, i used to do a lot more even when i ran the um in a cup and all that i built i built race cars with my dad since i've been 13 in a machine shop at five or six okay so even when i moved um uh down here in north carolina i would i still built cars i just i ended up building the building i didn't build in there for a little bit but um i would like go up to my dad's and and help him in certain cases and then i wanted to build another outlaw late model so i went up spent a month up there built the car and brought it down south just kept it at one of my buddy's shops and then it got to the point that i kept having customers i need a car or they call my dad i need a car well i was the one that was building them at, at that at that particular time so i was um is benson speed equipment still in business it still is but oh, okay. it, my dad's 86 and he's he's kind of okay. slowing down but he still still builds a lot of dump cans okay and brake ducts and stuff like that and you know he still has his quick change rear ends but he's kind of i think he's slowed down on doing that but it was just always helping him and then but at that point in time i was the only one who built cars and i was the only one that was probably going to so when i moved that took that part away but he built all the components and originally he built the cars obviously but uh so then i started people kept calling my dad wanting a car and then my dad would call me what do you want to do here and i says well i'm not going to keep going to michigan to do this this doesn't make any sense so i built a shop uh um down south there and and would build cars during the week. So you have a shop here? In, in, I do, uh, where I did. Oh, okay. I did. I, about uh, seven years ago, I think I finally just hung it up. Mm -hmm. So the, but I did that the whole part of my career all the way, um, all the way until I was done a truck race and I built cars on a, on a side, but it wasn't a lot, four or five years all. And, and then, um, you know, but you still got to take care of those customers. So I always, these are outlaw I, late model outlaw, customers. Outlaw late models run up my home track in Michigan, Indiana area. Okay. And 
Yeah, that was a big thing that you guys were into for a while was the yes. outlaw late models. Yeah. Um, and, and then how, <coughs> excuse me, uh, how did you uh, go over to super modified race? I mean, I know your dad ran them way back in the 60s. He and, and he won he won the Oswego Classic, which is huge. Um, but I, like, how did you venture into super modified racing? Or did you do that before stock cars? I did not. I, I actually funny. I was. I had an opportunity to run a sprint car when I raced or when I, when I first started racing, which I was like nineteen years old. I, I didn't start early. Mm-hmm. Um, I run a dirt car and I'll all I'll all dirt car and a sprint I car. Had, uh, you talking about no a late model? Oh, uh, okay. Like On. like what we see today, but it's okay. you know obviously technology is a lot better today. But and so I was doing that. Well, one of the engine builders that built engines for my dad and built some for me. He built sprint car engines, and I had an opportunity to run a sprint car. Well, he had brought it up, and I goes, well, I don't know. It might be pretty cool. And it wasn't a day, I think, and then my dad brought up, oh, I hear you're going to look at running a sprint car. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> That's what I he heard. He knew about I, it, it, and then I was like, um... That's what I had heard. I heard some in some interviews somewhere that you're you were gonna go open wheel racing and your dad shied you away from it, right? Well, he told me he says you're gonna make a choice. You're either gonna do that or you can continue working in the shop and have a car here. Well, you kind of weigh your options and yeah. go. Well, maybe I probably should just stay here and not run a sprint car. I'd like to have tried it. I don't know if I'd like to race them, but um, I'd like to try it. I like the late models. I and and did all that stuff. But Brad Lichty who the guy I run for now is is the one that caused this mm-hmm. to do this. So I was racing for him when he owned uh, Cayuga Speedway. They had myself and a couple other guys, uh, I think Matt Kenza, a couple other guys go up to Cayuga to run a race. He had a super there, and I think Tony Stewart was driving it that weekend, and he's like, hey, you want to take it for a hot lap? And I go, yeah, why would you not? Because you right. I knew my dad raced him. I was young mm-hmm. when my dad did it. And I never drove my dad's car. He was going to once let me go fire it up at, I think it was at Salem, Indiana. Oh, I was 13. I don't don't need to go start a super modified. At Salem. At Salem. I I know. And and back then, the super modifieds were not like what they are today with the engine hung on the left side of the car. Was it? That car was. It was uh, Max Stalker, Max, Terry, and Butch. I think they built that car. And it was a left side, now small block still though. Okay. Um, in, in their case, they were trying to make a small block in a in a super modified car, which was extremely fast. My dad held the record at Winchester Speedway for 15, 20 years before somebody wow. broke it. But, um, and so that, anyway, so that was my introduction to doing it. Then it was, hey, how would you want to race it? And I said, the only way I do it is at my home track at Berlin Raceway because I at least knew the racetrack. It's, it's okay. you know, those cars obviously are very exotic. So I didn't want to learn a car and a track at the same time. So we did test at Berlin and then uh, I did run a race and then it got, I think we got rained out. Well, we got past halfway, rained out and then uh, I forget where it was at, sixth or seventh. I'd spun out once, came back and Brad goes, where are you going now? I said, I'm going home. <laughs> And he goes, well, let's just go to Sandusky, Ohio. He says, on your way. And I go, kind of, but not, you know. <laughs> so we went over there, and that was probably the most coolest race, especially for him, because um, That was uh, what, Mike, High Miler, right? Yeah, well, yeah. it wasn't the High Miler race, but it was just a weekend race there. Okay. And so Mike Lichty won it. I run second, and uh, Dave McKnight run the third car. Well, he was second car. I was third car, I guess. And he run third in... I was beside Mike, and the other guy was right on her tail, so we went across the line. Oh, okay. I have not seen a picture. I don't know if Brad's got one or not, but um, that that was probably that one was of the only that was my second race. I was gonna say it was only your second time in a super modified. <laughs> so right? I thought, hey, these are kind of cool. Then I was um, I ran Brad's for a bit. Then I wasn't smart. I, I wasn't that smart, so I built my own, <laughs> and and then. Of course, we had a bad wreck with that car. Then I just went back to driving Brad's. Okay, okay. No, we're definitely we're going to talk about the the wreck that you had in the fire and and everything. But before that, um, it, going from a truck to a super modified, it had to feel like just night and day difference. Just they're extremely night and day difference. Right. There's, I mean, just you hit the button in in the the super man, it pins you back in the seat. I mean, I never drove a super in my life, but I ran TQs, which were smaller versions, it, and even those were wild to 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 run. So, what was it like the first time that you hopped in the super modified? Because 
Hornaday tried Joey Payne's car years ago at Jennerstown. So he had gotten a chance to try one. And of course, Tony had, you know, he's run a super, but, you know, for you guys, you know, doing their. They're crazy. I mean, they're, they're, it's hard to explain to people how fast they are. But when I say that we're running, we can run on a 5 h mile track, which would be a big track for us, um, like the old Cayuga Jacaska. We're running 165 mile an hour on a 5 h mile racetrack. I mean, there's a lot of truck tracks that we didn't run that fast. Right. And so to do that on a really small track like that is pretty insane. But the, the grip level is, is up there because of the, because of the wings, which is why they're so fast. But, right. You know, even like my home track, I mean, they're a couple of seconds faster than my outlaw late model. And in like four seconds faster than like an ARCA car going around Berlin. And that's just a seven, four six, seconds. Six. That's a huge <laughs> that's number. That's a huge number. And, <laughs> and so they are crazy. I mean, it, it, you know, it's like when I, um, I love the dirt track. So we'll go watch the sprint cars just like that. It's just crazy how fast they go around. Here. Right. The, the the Supers are to pavement what I, the Outlaws are to dirt. They, you know, absolutely. they really are. Yeah. yeah. I've never had a chance to drive one. But one of the coolest things I always thought about was the Supers was uh, I'd see them at Thompson every year for the World Series. And it's cold that weekend. And they go down the straightaway so fast you'd see the little contrails uh, yeah. come off the wings. I mean, they're 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 hauling ass that, that and they're And they're hard to drive. And, and I think the first time I drove it was at, like I said, my home track. And it, like after about a couple laps, you had to come in because the car was way ahead of you because you're so used to going a certain speed around that track. And, and it was fast then. And so, like, it's almost like you're still in the middle of the – backstretch but the car is going into turn three <laughs> and you have to once you figure that you know get back in the same i call it this in back into the car where the car is um then they're they're still hard to drive but you understand what's going on you understand the speed you understand uh certain things that cars are not very forgiving though you've you make a mistake it usually is going to cost you but the is it just having what to get used to the closing rate going into the corner like how fast you're going in and it's an unbelievable how fast you can go in the corner okay. and i mean some of the tracks you can go in there not use your brakes and not lift all the way not not quite not like a sprint car where they're gonna run wide open we don't have a lot of tracks like that but but running that car helped me in the trucks really because it you got so used to going that fast and and you're trying to you know trying to diagnose a car what it takes to to get it to go fast when i jump back in a truck it seemed like slow motion okay so i was ahead of the truck as opposed to being behind that car and you could really feel the difference in in what the car was doing because it was just at a such lower pace you didn't feel like you were going really okay. and it made a, a big difference i think on how you drove the truck and what you could feel i started feeling more and more in a truck because things were happening so much slower so okay. I thought that that was advantage always doing that. Do you do you uh, do you wish that you were still running the trucks more and more now? Do you you know after f getting that sensation and that feeling? No, I mean I was doing it when I was racing trucks, and probably you know I don't want to. I mean that's a, I had an opportunity. I was probably out five six years, and it, somebody wanted to come help uh, one of the teams and a driver. Which I did at Martinsville, and and uh, the crew chief at that time, I, I knew who he was. So he and he had worked with me in the trucks, and he says, "Bring your suit. I'm not going <laughs> to want to get in the middle of this, you know." And uh, so when he was we were there, so I did jump in a truck and went out and ran, and and it was, you know, that five years things had changed so much, anyways. And I and I was like, "Well, okay, this is different," but um, but the truck was good, and I was and I was actually pretty fast in it, but it was. So we got through that, and then they wanted me to go to Atlanta to help. So I went to Atlanta, and then uh, they were saying jump in a truck, and I was like, I don't, I don't really care to. I mean, Atlanta's tough to start with, and not running it for all those years. You know, it, it doesn't. You don't just jump in Atlanta and go. It doesn't work that way. But so I did take it for a couple laps, and I went out there, and I was, and then I came back in. And I says, we have to run through at least a set of tires for me to get acclimated back with the track again and a truck with all the different stuff that they had. This was after the repaving that the, they had done? Uh, I'm trying to think of what. So 08, you know, plus remember. five or so. We're, we're okay. still still in the old paving, I think. Okay. Right. And but it's still Atlanta. It's still it's fast. It's still Atlanta. And, and it, um, I just didn't feel comfortable, only because of the setup. I think if we would have put what I raced there, I would have been fine. But just try, and I says that I'm not the right person for that. You know, I says it's going to take too long for me to get to where, 
He was. He was faster than me now at Atlanta than I was. Who? who but which I, driver? Um, uh, to, 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 was Spencer Gallagher, I think it was. Okay. And, and, but I was just there to, to help on certain things that he was trying to feel versus, you know, because he was, he was fairly new in that area. So Martinsville, I could, I could run faster than he could, but Atlanta, he could run faster, but he'd been running. Um, that whole time and I was like it's it's not worth the money for me to run through a couple set of tires to get where you need I said but this is what I did feel when I was there and then they just make certain changes and they picked up and he did like it better so and I at that point in time I like I don't really need to help people on the big tracks just because I don't run them okay. like they do you ever thought about uh, uh, driver coaching or are you doing anything like that now or, I did uh, do it for a while okay. and but it um, I know we're talking off there a little bit but I kind of quit some of the like the truck stuff and all that because I didn't want to do the travel, mm -hmm. and so that put me back into doing all the travel. And if I'm going to do all that travel, I'm going to race. I'm not going to sit and watch. And, <laughs> but I did help uh, um, some drivers and things of that nature. And in mm -hmm. um, you know in a sport, I did it. Maybe not a lot of drivers, but over a little bit of time. And then, but it, it just got to the point where the cars have changed so much. I, I says. I don't mind doing it. I know you're paying me, but you would probably be better money spent to get somebody a little bit more current. Okay. There's certain things I can help them with, but I can't help with a car. You know, they're they're the engineers are taking over that and me not yeah. feeling what you know, when I ran the cars, you know, we're we're down in, you know, inch and a half sway bars and they're, now they're up like three inch or something stupid. And yeah. And I'm like, that's I I can't help you because I haven't experienced it. And everybody's coil binding now and Yeah, you know. I ran the coil bind stuff, but the but just that aspect of it's hard to tell somebody certain things to do on a track not knowing what the car feels. Because I, I, I drive by the seat of my pants. Right. And and to try to help somebody, that's hard to convey those those things. You know, looking at telemetry, yeah, okay, or, or whatever. But I don't know the nuisances of all those little things that they feel when they start to turn the wheel, you know, when the bar takes over, when the springs take over. It's hard for me to explain that when I haven't driven it. So I, I okay. just, at that point in time, I was, some people said I was still a big help. And in the other token, I didn't feel that I could give what they really needed. Mm -hmm. So I says, just take that part out and get somebody that can handle that. Don't, don't do a two-step program. Do one step. Get somebody who knows what's going on. Okay. Like, you've been around, though, long enough where you've seen all these different setup styles and things come in o over the years from... The old up and down, you know, uh, oh, set up yeah. on the car where they would land uh, to now where they're all locked down on the track. Um, for you, it, is it is it an improvement or, you know, do you do you think that we need to get like back to some older school stuff where we're not uh, spending so much money on the technology involved to be able to be able to afford to go racing? I think that's that. That's hard for me to answer, anyways. But I mean, it's hard to de-engineer things. I get that it is, but it, it uh, the aerodynamics is what caused all this. When somebody finally figured out that aerodynamics makes a big difference, yeah. as opposed to mechanical. Mm -hmm. it's, it's some huge. people say this is where it went wrong. I don't think it, I mean it, the the ingenuity of the sport's the best part of the sport. I like mm -hmm. and trying to figure something out how to make car go faster. That's that's what I like. Mm -hmm. They've taken. A little bit of that away, but not a lot. I mean, like cup car, it's all the same parts, all the same thing. Yeah, where, yeah. like in our all our late models, you can do a lot of stuff. The super modified, you can do a lot of stuff. There's, um, and my late model stuff, I mean, we used to lock them down and do. I got creative on some pretty cool stuff, <laughs> and that nobody still have done yet. And uh, and <laughs> that cool. that was fun. Yeah. Now, the, like the super, you don't need to do that. The car's got the wings on it. You don't need to lock them down. We're but the ingenuity you in know. those are wild. I mean, oh, it's wild. I mean, that is. I tell people that's as close as you're going to get to an Indy car without being an Indy car. It, you know, I mean, they're as fast as one. I mean, right. I mean, you look at an Oswego yeah. Super Modified. I mean, there's just so much technology in them yeah. and, and everything. And uh, I'd gotten a whole new respect for those cars when I had started doing those races up there on TV for Speed Sport. You know, we did the Oswego Classic and um, the, the Super Nationals. You know, mm -hmm. so we did both styles. And there's so much of a difference between the Oswego Supers and an Isma Super, you know, uh, like one of them they has are. the onboard, yeah. the inboard suspension. The other ones have the shock perches that are way out there in the in the air. And well, they people run both. Right. Uh, you know, the difference the difference is wings. Mm -hmm. You know, having wings on a car, the car acts very differently, and uh, so the setup is different. The car basically could be the same. 
mm-hmm. you know, but if you're going to take an Isma car and run a classic, you're going to be in trouble. But if you take a classic car and try to run it with the Ismas, you're going to be in trouble. Right. In a short period of time. Like if you're going to try to run them the same weekend, one of them you're going to be good and the other one you're not. Mm-hmm. Just depending on what car that you, that you, if you're going from wing to them, non-wing, you're not going to be good to the field and same vice versa. Just because the setup's different, you know, you're, you're. You've run the classic, right? I have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I've done it once in the Isma car. <laughs> oh, you did it in Isma car? It, yeah. We took the wing off it. We ran the Friday night show and then run Sunday. <laughs> and and L- it was with, not uh, good. With Lichty? Yeah. Okay. And, but then I've <laughs> ran, ran it once with the full non-wing setup thing and I ran good. Whose car did you run then? Oh, sh- uh, <laughs> you get it. Uh, Clyde Booth helped me, but it, I, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, okay. Ray Grams. It was Ray Grams' car. Okay. Um, yeah, those extreme chassis, I think. Yeah. Uh, and, or the, uh, what's the guy's name? Coloca. Paul yeah, Coloca. Coloca. Who built it. He's, he's and, a beautiful car builder, too. Yeah. Oh, my God. Nice. Some of the yep. stuff that they brought to the track. I mean, the F1 style nose with the drop yeah. wings <laughs> on them. I mean, they're getting, they're getting insane. But you got to admit, though, like, that is the cool part about racing nowadays that we don't see as much because remember back in the day and I brought this up on other shows you when you heard someone was building a car you kind of got interested or excited about it because you knew they, if they were a good car builder or not if they were going to build something that was really nice you know nowadays it's they're they're stamped out and they're more mass produced that's to a certain cool, extent that's yeah. the cool part yeah. about the supers though like you can still you can still build your own. Right. You, you can, can still build, uh, you know, yeah. try to build a, a mousetrap. Yeah. You know, so that's what I, I dig about it. So. Yeah, absolutely. What, uh, does that kind of inspire you when, you, when you're building stuff uh, and, and making stuff? It does. Um, you know, but each, you know, this, this circuit's going to have areas where you can be, your ingenuity can be whatever you want. Mm-hmm. And then you get over here, you don't, you may not have that opportunity. I think like in the cup stuff and, and in most of NASCAR stuff and even the template body cars, you, you, the higher you go, the less ingenuity that you can do because everybody's got to have the same part and scenario. Yeah. I get that for the competition part of it. And, and um, so it, it just depends on what you're doing. On the late models, we could still be pretty creative. Mm-hmm. You know, certain rules you got to um, abide by, obviously, like anything else. It's just that when you get to the supers, there's less and less rules mm-hmm. and so you can you can do kind of you're going to open what you want to do right you can get creative that was uh my old my my father raised midgets uh in nema for for years and you know back in the day you can you know build your own stuff and go race you know because he was known for having a mazda engine a rotary in his midgets for years so that's mm-hmm. what they ran but you know they also ran in the years where the badgers were around which were like small super modifieds too and guys would just build these wild and radical creations. You know, Lindblad was a huge uh, builder of midgets and super modifieds. And, you know, just to see some of the stuff that they built was was amazing over the years. But um, anyway, going back, let's actually dial it back a bit. You know, you were talking about working in your dad's shop back in the days. What were those days like working with your father? Because it, it sounds like, you know, you're, it was all just racing for you. Like, did you ever like work a real job or was it ever working? In, was it just, did you make your living in racing? No, I, I, I worked a real job, but I was older when I did that. Not to say older, older, but so I worked in, my, in the shop and so, you know, f- clean up shop, whatever. And then I was, I was probably about six. My dad started having me running parts on a lathe and things of that nature. And, um, at six, at six, cutting stuff, <laughs> whatever. It didn't matter, you know, and, and then, uh, it just kept evolving. I mean, he taught me a lot of stuff and, you know, he mailed quick change rear ends, things of that nature. So I, I worked on patterns that we had uh, for the castings and things of that nature. So I had a little understanding of that going on. And then as, as time went, it started getting where I was doing more and more to where my dad was racing. So, you know, he had a couple guys working there. And then it, um, it was a point that I was always working on my dad's car now. And, and then building parts. And mm-hmm. then it started to the point where I started building uh, chassis and so I built my first chassis and when I was 13 years old really your for your first car when yeah. you were 13 
And that it, is unheard. Like, think about that though. Nowadays, crazy. you know, thirteen-year-olds are not. Some of them here and there are, but like a thirteen to be able to, you know, put the car on the jig or put the cha- the the chassis on the jig and weld it all together. Yeah, just it was it was insane. I didn't know any different. It, I figured every kid did this stuff. Right. I don't know, you know. <laughs> and so that that was a lot of fun. And then I I was laughing. I think it. I think my dad. I I drove my dad's car up Berlin when I think when I was 13, 12, 12 or thirteen. And just in practice, the late model, the late model, and <laughs> and I, I I did bang it up a little bit, and so so then I was like, well, I don't, I just like building cars, you know. So I, that's what I was doing. But like, say, I my first car that I built, we build frames and we do the you know suspension interior, but that's about as far as we went with them. So my dad's like, well, you know, put the you know make it a roller so i did that and then we'll do all the interior so i did all that so you never drove the first car you built no well that's where i'm getting with this so oh, okay okay i went and then he says start putting a body on it and i kept asking whose car is this because i knew everybody that was getting a car buying a car who i was building it for and he never had answered a question so i started putting a body on it which i kept asking well who's this for this doesn't make any sense we don't usually do bodies so one day, a uh, guy by the name of Chris Patterson, um, they pull on a driveway. They'd never been there. And they come, and uh, we built both dirty and late models, or uh, asphalt cars. And they were looking for a car, and, and I said, well, okay. You know, I, I sold a lot of cars, too. And then he says, well, you we want it kind of complete. And I go, well, I got a car right here. I'm putting a body on. And I, w- I was three-quarters of the way done with the body. And so I sold it to him. And then my ma handled a lot of that stuff. So I was like, yeah, well, go see her, whatever. And he drives off. My dad goes, who's that? Well, at the time, I didn't know who Chris Patterson was. I just, I don't know. What do they want? And said, well, looking at a dirt car. Oh, all right, what are we doing? And I go, well, I sold him that car in a garage. And I see he kind of put his head down. Well, he goes, well, I was letting you build that for you to raise it. Uh. And I was like. Well, you should have told me that. I didn't know. Right. And so then they come back over to get more parts. Now, this is like in December. And, and how old were you at the time? I was 13. Okay, still 13. And and it was the first car that I built from the ground up. And um, anyways, you get laughing. They came over for parts. And then they're sitting there talking. Next thing I know, my dad is like, well, take the kid with you. They were going down to Florida for Speed Weeks to run. You know, they run Jacksonville, uh, East Bay. Okay. and Okella. Right. And it's just, well, just places. take the kid with you. <laughs> and I'm like looking around. I'm like, well, what about school? I'm, nah, I don't care about that. We'll worry about that later. So he, we don't know these people. They took you out of school and you just, yeah. You just and I, mean, they, I met them when they bought the car and they came over for parts. And my dad's like, well, go with them for two and a half weeks down to Florida race. And it, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we, Jumped in a, you know, he had a motorhome at the time, and uh, we jumped out, went to Florida. So I, parents would never let that happen nowadays. Not because, today. Yeah, and and I still surprised then. So I I went down to these people, and um, it was such a great time. And the one there was like two stories on that that were just hilarious. Well, go ahead, share them. That's that's it, what we're here for. So I think, and my dad pushed this. I didn't do it, but I still say I built the first aluminum steering wheel for okay. race cars. So at thirteen, I built one. And so, meanwhile, I was like, I go, I wonder if Chris would, so I brought it with me. So we had it in the car. He's like, it's lightweight. I mean, a lightweight. <laughs> and so we're sitting at trailer and they're um, getting ready for uh, practice. They're still buying tires and rims because they're a little bit different than the Michigan stuff. And this guy walks by the car and he stops and he backs up, picks the steering wheel up and he's looking at it. He looks at me because I'm sitting on a trailer because my dad always taught me I can't leave the, can't leave the hauler can't walk around right. you know and he looks at me and he's looking at the wheel and he starts to walk away with it at that moment in time chris came up and i said this guy just stole the steering wheel and of course i'm flipping out because i built it right and and he was what guy and i'm pointing a guy in that white suit with the green writing on it and uh he starts to laugh he goes it'll be fine <laughs> he goes he runs practice comes back and he's like where'd you get this and he just points at me and they go where'd you get this i said i made it and he's like what no this no this steering wheel i says i made it yeah and he just kind of looked at me and he pulled out a card handed to me he says send me 30 of them 
It was Charlie <laughs> Schwartz. Really? Yeah. So no like, kidding. Yeah. So within the first day of being down in Florida, I sold 30 steering wheels. Wow. And I sold a lot of them. Rayburn called for them. All of a sudden, everybody and her brother wanted them. No kidding. Of course, then Randy Sweet started making them. And <laughs> okay. Gotcha. But I still swear that I was. Uh, we were the first ones that made one of those. Yeah, but, Randy's um, back up around your area too, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My, okay. yeah, my dad and him raced. Uh, they were were many, they competitors or rivals or, or they, competitors? But yeah. um, in you business know, too. Not together. Now the only thing that they did together <coughs> is, uh, the spindles. My dad built spindles. Um, so him, uh, Randy Sweet and Harry Olby, they got together. All three of them designed a spindle, and I think it was pretty much based off of what my dad's was, and and then. Randy and uh, Harry O because uh, Randy drove for him, and so then he started mass producing them, and that's how Sweet Manufacturing got started. Okay, all right. So you left Speed Weeks with an order for thirty steering wheels <laughs> at thirteen years old. Yeah. So, they, so at this point, are you thinking I'm in I'm in business for myself, or I'm bringing no, business I back just, to the? I just work for my dad. I okay. I, I never wanted to go in business on my own. So side that was the one story. What was the other story from Speed Weeks? So as we're down there, I think it was the second or third week, or second or third race. We we had switched tracks. We started at East Bay. I think we were there three or four days, mm-hmm. and then we went to. I think it was Jacksonville. If I, it's either Jacksonville or Kello. I don't remember which one, but we got there early. We went the night before, so we're just unloaded, working on a car, and there's not really anybody there. So I thought that's my opportunity to walk around, and so anyways, I'm just walking around the cars, and there's. Uh, guy working on the rear end of his car and, and he's underneath there with a hammer just trying to beat the pinion out of the rear end because he <laughs> broke a uh, he either broke a pinion or ring or whatever and being 13 your filters are not really good right so I'm like <laughs> I go that ain't coming out like that of course turns around looks at me tells me to blank off <laughs> you can and, sorry you can drop four letter words yeah, we have an R in. that's a good one though <laughs> he told me to F off so and so I did. I walked away and I go down to Chris. Now Chris, they, yeah, I'm 13. I don't know. Chris is a big guy. I mean, he's um, very well known, very fast in Michigan. He won a lot of races in our cars. Okay. And he comes down to Chris because there's only like five of us there, and then it's kind of same like the other one. He, he goes, I can't, I can't get the penny out of this rear end. How to do it? And he goes, Well, just take him with you. And of course, he already told me to <laughs> blank to off, fuck right? off. Yeah. And uh, so. <laughs> And he's like, oh, it's really? And he goes, yeah. So I go down there and I and I got a torch, got it. Anyway, so I take it out, put all the pinion and all that back into it. And then he was like, like how? Do you, how do you know how to do this? So I go, well, my dad, we built quick change rear ends. And then he's like, well, sorry, I told you F off. You know, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. And so anyway, those are my two fun stories for being down there. But um, yeah, because, you know, you're yeah. an older guy. At 13, thinking... you, you just don't think about it. Right. Right. And it's like, I, there's no way he's going to do this. Right. But that's just what I grew up doing. I've, I've learned so much from my dad yeah. and, and he was, um, very ahead of his time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, th- I think he's still like, he, he ran certain modifieds, built his own cars, did all that, run them in Michigan there. Mm-hmm. And I think it was 1966. He actually took it to Oswego. Right. And they don't know who he is, whatever. And he was, he was fast and he qualified and they go, well, we don't believe that. We don't believe he was that fast. So he made him requalify three times. And then it got to the point there was like five guys with stopwatches on the front stretch. And because he was, I don't know, whatever that bracket was, he mm-hmm. was the first one outside of the second bracket they were in into the next. And they were like, okay, maybe he did go that fast. The first lap was good, but he kept working on a car and then they'd make him qualify again. He kept going faster. Well, then he won the race. Right. And so I think he's, I, I don't know if it's almost at eight that he's still one of the only outsiders to everyone else who would class. I was going to say, he's like the only one from cool. Michigan, right? The only one to ever win the race. Or, because uh, Davey Hamilton so. won it, but he's from Idaho, I think. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. But. Um, it was just I, very I, rare back right, in the 60s to have somebody do that. Right. Back then, especially, you know, Oswego, because that, even back in the 60s, that was considered a huge huge event you know i mean oh, absolutely. oswego yeah, was, some of them used that to springboard to indy you, you know the john cox uh, yeah. went out there and they raced and they went to indy too and you know, that that's that's really cool that you were you there when he won at oswego no i was 
Let's see. I was three, so no. Oh, okay. Gotcha. gotcha. I'm old, but back then I wasn't. <laughs> okay. So, um, all right, moving forward a little bit then. Um, you finally started. When did you finally start driving? Um, I was 19. I think my, my dad had a bad crash at Berlin, and I, he got a concussion and, and things of that nature, and I think he was about done with it. And Because there was three weeks to go, and I, you know, I, the car was bad. And and I I pulled the jig out when we got home that night, and I said, "Man, we got to build the car in a week. This car was not fixable." And so we're we're thrashing on it, or I was, and start cutting frame rails that night. I think it worked at like three, four in the morning. And my dad's like, "Don't stop, stop." And I go, "You can't. We we're going to build the car in a week." And for us, that's tough. You know, the manufacturers that build cars for production we didn't build production cars we built cars and you know those guys can build a car in a week for us that's that's insane it takes me four or five weeks for me to build a car five six weeks right. and um so anyways and then in the morning he was like don't do it so that's when he decided he wasn't going to go race so as the winter got going i was like well who's going to race for the company then and so then i built a dirt car and went dirt car racing Okay, so you first started on dirt. I started on dirt. I ran dirt for three years. Okay. My dad didn't want me to, but we were building so many dirt cars and didn't have that much expertise in the cars. The cars that we sold were fast, but to help them was a little harder. Those guys were way smarter at running the cars than what we were build them. And so that a lot of them people obviously helped us in that area. And so that I built a car, rent and ran in, in the dirt series. Um, and I ran three years, but then, so that's where the job thing that came in because um, my dad, my dad's workaholic. So, mm. and it, my saying is, I say, I used to love Sundays because I only had to work from <laughs> noon to six. So I, that was my day off. And Sunday was my day off because I only had to work from noon to six. Are you a workaholic too or no? I used to be. I don't think I am now. Okay. But um, so it was one of those deals where he was, we just, you know, like, anybody you get a little bit of argument and I told him I says well I'll go and get a real job if you want and he and then he was kind of yeah I'd like to see you do that well I did and I got a job in a tool and die shop now I'm still in high school this was during my senior year mm -hmm. and so I started working for uh actually it was hard rush machining which is Tim Steele's dad back back in the day he had a mold and machine shop and stuff so I was working there so I was going to school in the morning then went to work at um, the machine shop there. But then my dad, to be the way he is, because I still laugh about it, well, you still work for me. You know that, right? So now I'm going to school working for that guy and working for my dad. <laughs> and and then so when I started racing, I was running, working a full-time job working for my dad and trying to race. So And going to school. Well, then at that point in time, I just got out of school. I was okay. out of school before I raced. But the, okay. um, so it was just kind of funny because it was – you had to do your work. That's what provided me with the race car. I was okay. working for my dad. Okay. And so, but I didn't, it was 10 o'clock at night before I had to get to work on my race car. Well, I had to be to work at seven in the morning. Oh so God. it was like, I, I, that, uh, after three years of dirt, I, at the end of that, I was just getting burned out. I was like, I can't work three jobs. I call that working on a race car, just third job. Yeah. And, and so I quit my job that I was doing, um, or no, I, I took a year off of racing. And then I just went to the track and helped customers. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to go to asphalt. And I built a car to run uh, in my home track at Berlin. But I was still working the two jobs. Have you run dirt since? Uh, a couple of times. Uh, oh, when okay. I was running a cup series. Um, oh, that's right. The trucks ran on dirt too. And, well, yeah. no, it was, I'm, try, I'm trying to think what year this would have been. It would have been in a, I ran for uh, Valvoline between 2000 and 2004. Mm-hmm and or part of it wasn't but um it was a 10 car mm -hmm. and james ince is crew chief on a on a car he always had been in dirt racing also and asphalt stuff he did a lot of different things and uh, so he was real good friends with uh oh shoot what's his name now but anyways he had a grt car and okay. james like you want to run it so we went to sedalia i think it is um illinois we ran that race, ran, ran decent, and then we went to Schrader's track and then ran that. Okay. And that's cool. So that 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 was a lot of fun. Oh, dirt is so much fun. And that so that was that, and then 
years later, I run at my home track when he dirted um, Berlin. I ran a car there too. Okay. So, so <clears throat> excuse me. At what point did uh, did you think to yourself, I'm, I want to go to NASCAR or I want to make this my living and be a, a race car driver? I don't think that ever happened. It was it just happened when I when I built the car and ran at Berlin. Um, my first two years struggle. Berlin's a hard race track. Still one of the hardest tracks. I took my top turning, right? five hardest tracks I've ever raced at. Yeah. And then I finally figured it out. And we won a lot of races. Well, when Butch Miller moved um, down south to run the Cup stuff, we used to build all the rear ends and spindles for their cars when they run ASA. Well. Uh, Leroy Troop from Troop Motorsports asked me, "Hey, you want to run this car?" And I said, "Yeah." That was the the twenty one car, right? The red twenty one was the in my ASA, own, in but ASA. it was it was um, it it was, but it okay. was you know the fifty two of the Butch Miller Ram, but that was a car other than we changed uh, okay um, the stuff. And but then he also went to a two car team, so Bobby Seneca was there because he he needs somebody to run for a championship because that's what. Uh, uh, Butch was doing and so learned a lot going to do that but at first I was like why do I want to do that that's like 300 lap races I don't want to do that because I like 35 50 lappers and so I did I did that for two years and then uh, I finished eighth in points the first year finished fourth in points my second year you got rookie of the year right yeah yes a yeah yep. okay. and then and then troop wanted to go down to a one car team and but Bobby won a championship, so it made sense. I meant he, he was having a hard time telling me, but and I I said, look, just what do you what do you want to do? And he goes, well, I want to go one car team. And I go, well, you'd be a fool not to take Bobby. You just won your championship, right? And I says, don't I, you know? We'll figure it out. No big deal. And so then I didn't have a ride. I'm still working for my dad, and um, and then that's when that new car came out with the all the TV stuff coming and all that. Well, we didn't have time to build customer cars and parts. We didn't have time to kind of figure out a design to build and try to do it on our own. That and was when ASA evolved from like regular straight rail late models to, to the perimeter. To the perimeter. Yes. Yeah. Well, they were slightly perimeter before, but then this was the right. full blown narrower car and you know, a, things that, that was nature. when AC Delco came in yes. to sponsor the series because that was my first introduction to you was in that red and white 21 car yep. in in ASA yep. you, you running that uh, um, those were such cool years and how cool is it to have Bob Seneca as a teammate I mean God the guy's a it's, legend he is but he's also very quiet and he holds everything to himself pretty good oh really <laughs> yeah. oh okay and, although so, I, I was, love was it hard to learn from him um as far as a driving and working on cars, I learned that from my dad. Okay. And and so, yeah, it was very hard. You know, <laughs> we're, it, I mean, there were certain things we talk about because at that point I, w I was starting to go pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And then he, he's, you know, I think today people seem to help people more than they did back then to a certain extent. When it comes to the drivers, driver the driver's not gonna help another driver because they don't want it, you to be close to them. Mm -hmm. And I think Winchester is the only place he really helped me. I was like, dude, I'm scared to death of this place for some I've been there. And then he, he went out, I followed him. He gave me a couple of pointers and all of a sudden, bam, I'm fast. And, and he goes, this is why I don't help you. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he does and he doesn't. I, I, I'm not saying that he didn't cause he did, but not, right. it wasn't his. Uh, well, a place like Winchester too. I mean, you gotta get some type of advice or, or oh, absolutely. I mean I've never been to Winchester I've watched a lot of races from, I don't care to, to go tell. back and run that track that's really? how bad it is. Yeah, really not bad that's just <clears> you know <throat> so, then there was bumps you got the tunnel you had so Winchester scared you oh absolutely was, really yeah okay and wow, you okay. know there was a big hole going into three so you had to go into the corner within two and a half feet of the wall enter in the corner really? yeah, on a short track that's just something you don't do yeah. And and but that place you had to just going into three you know, the rest of it you kind of do what you want but um I and I had problem with that now did you ever with. run uh Concord Speedway the the tri oval here not. because we had Freddie Query on the show and he told me that Bob Seneca packed up and left he said screw this this yeah. place ain't for me he he didn't he didn't like it so I don't know if you ever got to try the Concord. I've been I've been around the track and we tested a, a cup car there which wouldn't be nothing like what they run there mm -hmm. and i could say oh this would be difficult in a very fast car I, so when they run the super modifieds brad and them come down there and he asked me if i'm driving i said no i've gone there and watched a race and i go no i don't need to do that 
I announced the uh, the North South Shootout the years that they had the Super Modifieds there at Concord, and that was mm. one of the wildest Insane. things I ever saw in yeah. my life. Well, first off, they buried one off into the into the foam blocks, yep. it, you know, and the kid got busted up pretty bad, and then. They were going so fast, they were ripping billboards off the, the fence down the back straightaway. So it was, it, it was I remember, wild. I don't remember where the late model runs around there, but I remember, you know, Clyde Booth, his cars, we run against him uh, in, the, in the Isman deal. And, I mean, he was running like 11.2 seconds in the race there. I mean, it's just insane. Not a half mile. <laughs> yeah, you know. And, and I think he ran into a problem, too. I think they broke something. But, uh, yeah, I, I didn't... Uh, yeah, I was looked at track. I mean, I think it'd be cool if you're going to run there, but um, but I've never raced there. No. Okay, uh, I didn't know because there there were some places that you know just scared people. Like I, uh, for me, Flemington was the place that scared the crap out of me. I don't know if you ever raced at Flemington no. before. Flemington was a uh, five eighths of a mile square track, and you just circled the place. And uh, I ran my father's midget there, and a midget on a five eighths of a mile track where you are hammered down and just you know just the centrifugal force is pulling you further and further out you come up and it's walls on both sides oh yeah too that's the yeah, yeah. so <laughs> claustrophobic <laughs> right and they always used to say if you're hooked up at, at flemington the groove is like outside you know outside the fence so yeah flemington always scared the crap out of me uh so that was the big one for me that, so i didn't know winchester yeah, yeah winchester winchester and then uh salem Tom, thompson i that, now salem I, I had no problem with okay thompson i love thompson, thompson. I, I love the track, and but first time we went there with Super with Brad, mm -hmm. and I'm like, this car's so good. I feel good about it, right? And uh, come in, I see what Chris Purley is running around there. Of course, Chris Purley pretty much will win every race. Right. Yeah, he's and, the man. And I'm like, how is he three quarters of a second faster than we are? I don't make any sense. A car feels so good. So I'm laughing with Brad, and and I go, I don't understand it. I said, this car seems so fast through the corner, and I and it. And I go, what, where am I going to pick up three quarters of a second? And it's just impossible. Yeah. He was going to have to drive into the, drive into the corner a little further. I go three quarters of a second. That no, that ain't going to work. And he goes, <laughs> no, like seven car lengths further. And I go, I, what are you nuts? And he goes, that's what they're doing. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no way. And I haven't been in a super that much. And um, so for the heat race, of course, put new tires on it. And and me and Brad got a good trust thing going. I said, okay, if he thinks seven car lengths further than I've ever gone <laughs> into a quarter before, I believe him. So I did, and it, it was like we we picked up a lot of that three quarters of a second. And it, it uh, so I was actually leading the heat race, and and uh, Perley got by me at the end. So I got an opportunity to see where he was running. I said, okay, that makes sense. But I was I thought I was fast until I saw the time, and then he says I got to go seven <laughs> car, seven car lengths. I'm at, usually I'm used to hearing a half to a right. car length further. Thompson is seven. such an awesome track, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my God, but Thompson then, is amazing. But then somebody broke something or throttle stuck going into turn one, <laughs> and I says I don't like this place anymore based off what I saw did that car. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I don't care about. Yeah, fun you, track. If you Don't wreck, get me wrong. oh yeah, it's amazing. But it's fast. Yeah, it may, and it's it's it makes you want to drive in the corner harder and harder because yes. I've been around the place in a in a Pro Four modified and in a midget, and in a midget it's pretty wild. It, you know, it's it's twitchy as hell. But that's cool though. See, that's what I like about you though is that you, you know you've had an amazing first and second act of your career. If you really think about it, because. In the first half of your career, I remember you winning Rookie of the Year, then a championship, then a Rookie of the Year, then a championship, then a Rookie of the Year. Like in, in, yeah. in, uh, you did it in ASA, you did it in the Bush Series, and you did it in the Cup Series too. And then after your Cup career, you kicked ass over in the trucks. Yeah. So it's you've had like a great first and second half uh, act it's, of your career. Yeah, it's been fun. And I, and I think that I wanted to win the championship in the Supers, at, and we tried one year. Mm -hmm. And with Brad, but we had um, a couple of engine failures that kind of took us out. We still run third, but and then, but I don't feel I wanted. I don't. That's not my desire to go win that again. I want to go win some races with it, but um, not championship. We're not running all the races this year. But um, what's but yeah, the big super modified race you want to win? Is there a big? Is it the Star what? Classic? Is it is it the Oh no, my Classic? home track. I'd love to win there. Oh, uh, win so, the super. Just yeah, just at home. It don't matter where it's at. I've I've won four, I think. And uh, they have not been at my home track. Okay. And uh, when I when I wrecked my car, we were extremely fast, and then it just 
happened. But um, but no, I just I, I just like that aspect of it and do that. But uh, but yeah, so I, I won a championship in my LL8 model. Then I went to the ASA. Then we, we did that. And then uh, I did Bush Series and we got a championship there. And the cup, the best best I finished is 11th. Uh, one point out of the top 10 in, in the cup stuff my second year. Right. And then it kind of um, didn't run good there for a bit. Then we ran good. And and then it was just not just not in the direction I really wanted to to carry with with the teams or however you were at. I think the last team I was at was probably one of the better better ones. I think when I was with Bahari, um, uh, that was a great scenario. Uh, where that was, was actually a really team. good team for you because, I mean, essentially you uh, you were – Michael Walsh was vacating the seat, and he had driven for that team for so many years and moved on to the Wood Brothers, right? Yeah, so then I, you, I think it was Wood Brothers. Yeah, yeah. and then, so then you were tabbed to run the 30 car, and uh, you had shown a lot of – good runs in that car too i think there's there was a lot of promise there and things of that nature and then um then i, I got at it was kind of a weird situation but um to ask to go over to roush and and i did that and then i would have liked to have stayed uh you know with bahari but um you know there's always pluses minus to everything that happened so and then the, the 10 car we ran ran pretty good mm-hmm. and but you know there's there's it's so engineer involved now that what you're going to unload with is how you're going to run. Mm-hmm. You know, if you unload in your 30th quick, well, you're pretty much going to there kind of when I was there, it was getting to that point, but kind of when I was there, you could unload and be horrible and still run quick in the cup series, in the cup series. Okay. Like but we were horrible at uh rock and ham. I like qualified 28th. It would not good in practice, things of that nature and just made driving for which team this would have been with the 10. Okay. And, and with Valvoline, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and we had changed so much stuff, and the car became good, and we ended up winning a race. Well, those those days aren't going to happen anymore. It's just um, why is that? I think I think that you know the aero aspect of it, and the engineering part of it, and all this stuff. If you unload good, you're going to probably be good the whole weekend. If you unload bad, you're probably not going to be very good the entire weekend. Okay, I don't. It just you're just not going to do those changes that we used to do, and. And I think a lot of that is just because a car is aero independent or dependence on it, and and things of that nature, and just a little bit off on them cars makes it makes it really tough. And and I think there's a cars never perfect. I mean, I've never heard of really a race car driver. I think even if they lap the field, they could say, "If I could have had a little better here." <laughs> there's no such thing as a perfect car. No. My dad tells me that and, all the time. And it, you know, so I think the uh, back when I was running uh, the box to get better was pretty big. Mm-hmm. And today, I think that box is very small. Like you're you're in the box, or you're out of the box. They've engineered you into such a small circle that I think it, so. Yeah. And I mean, good or bad, it don't matter. I mean, there's so if you're not in within that ballpark, then when you show up, it's be tough. you're screwed. Okay. Yeah, it, it was just tough. It's everything's so close that just a little bit is a lot. Mm-hmm. And you know, I always hear people say they don't like the new generation stuff. And I, and I always laugh. I go, well, when Richard Petty and Kerry Arbor were running, everybody loved them. They didn't like the new people. Well, then everybody likes these people. And then I said, that's a trend that will never change. I mean, mm-hmm. that happens at local tracks. It happens everywhere. Uh, and, uh, and over the years, I, I mean, I remember hearing, you know, 10 years ago, people complaining, ah, you know, 20 years ago, racing was great. And then 20 years before that, they would say, ah, 20 years ago, racing was great. They, you know, they've always done that over the years. Um, and it happened in the Cup Series too, and they went to like the Lumina bodies, and they started. They went to the straight door panels instead of rolling the doors. People were complaining and everything. Um, have you gotten to tinker around with any of the new generation Cup cars, no. or look at them up close, or anything? Or s- I have not seen one. Really? No. Okay. I I, I don't. Uh, I might have followed a little bit, but not not like I used to. Mm-hmm. But you know, before before this new car, you could go into a shop and they would yeah, you walk around. Well. When that new car come out, uh, one of my good friends, he works, he worked at Penske's on Indy cars. Mm-hmm. And, and now, mind you, I've been out for ever. Like, I think last time I ran was in 09. Okay. And in, at, in a NASCAR event. And uh, he was retiring, so I was like, hey, I want to I wanna go through the shop. So, so I mean, he talked to his bosses, a snap, whatever, and they told me that I could not go in a cup shop. I could only go in the IndyCar shop. And I, I was like, that don't make any sense. 
And they go, well, you too, you know too much about cars and all that. And I go, I don't care. I don't, <laughs> what am I going to see? I, I don't talk to anybody. So I didn't get to see the new cars. I got to walk through all the IndyCar stuff, which is very cool stuff. Yeah, right? it is. And, yeah. and Penske's place. Wait a minute, amazing. if I can interrupt you quick. Didn't I, I heard a rumor. Didn't you get an offer to drive for an IndyCar team or something uh, at one point in your career when you were looking for a different ride? I got an offer to test one at Milwaukee when I was doing ASA. Oh, okay. And it was... Um, Who's IndyCar team? Patrick's. I think it was a good team back then. Yeah, pa yeah Patrick and, Racing was yeah, a really yeah. good team. Mm -hmm. And I, I have no desire to, to race one, okay. but I would have been cool to drive one. Yeah, absolutely. And, but then the, when they were going to go there, we were racing somewhere, mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it, and they weren't going to move their test. So that was just a... They asked, couldn't do it, end of it. Okay. And which was absolutely <laughs> fine with me. Okay. I love them. Right, right. I think it'd be cool to test one. I would yeah. not want to race one. <laughs> uh, that'd be really cool. I mean, dude, you're driving a super modified now. I, I mean, it. it's I close know. to it. But so I wouldn't take my super modified to uh, Phoenix like they used to. I don't know if yeah. I'd do that. Man, that, that was crazy. That's crazy. But, and then Otto took uh, their car down to a homestead. They ran the super at homestead. Did you see that? I did not. That would be cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. His his car owner, John Nicotra, I don't know if you ever yeah, met him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's on his Facebook page or somewhere. They took the, the Super down there, and they ran test laps around now, Homestead, I would Miami. Do that. I would do that at Homestead just because of the banking and stuff like that. But That was why. I asked Otto, what would you think of it? He, he said it was awesome. He said he was flat out most of the way. He said he, he wished he would have taken the wing off because the wing was actually slowing him down. Oh, a lot, yeah. It was, uh, you know. It but was, it makes you, makes you comfortable in the corner. <laughs> man, it probably makes you real But God, can you imagine super modifieds around That'd be uh, insane. Homestead? I mean, I used to watch the Copper Classic with the Supers back then, and that those were, that, that was insane. But um, of all the, the, the series and, and the, the cars that you ran over the years, who are some of the guys that you had the most fun racing with that, that you enjoyed, you know, d you know, doing your, your competing with? Oh, gosh. Was it ASA? Was it NASCAR? Was it Supers? Well, they're all of them. I mean, yeah. running, running my home track with the all LA models, of course, you got a bunch of guys you just love to race with. I mean, hard competitors and, you know, and things of that nature. And then, you know, ASA, Mike Eddy was the was a guy the mike and there. bobby seneker and uh you know the uh sky hansen a couple other guys they, they were the guys to beat mm -hmm. and and we were relatively quick um getting to run in that area that they were mm -hmm. you know and like our second year we started getting pretty good at it. and our third and fourth year obviously we got real good at it but um so running with those guys were amazing running like Running at every track with those guys is like, you know, as long as you ain't beating a bang. I mean, there was some great racing. And, of course, me and, you know, Mike Eddie, we had our little moments every once in a while. Everybody does. <laughs> and, but, like, after. You've had some dust-ups with Mike Eddie? Well, everybody has. But, oh, like, what, what happened? Well, I mean, just, you know, he gets spun out or whatever. He, okay. he doesn't like how you passed him. or Because I, I passed him once. It's super clean, but it was aggressive. But it was. We never touched and he spun me out for it. And I go, why? I don't understand. <laughs> and and uh, but then like when I left there and came down to run Bush, I still came back and run ASA races, okay. especially at ones at home track. And so I come up to Berlin there and me and uh, Mike Eddie had a race there that we run like 15, 18 laps side by side within the last 25 laps of the race. Really? And it was just, it was crazy. I think I got by him with like four laps to go. And we, we were on side by side, never touch each other, just, you know, so running that. So you have your people there in a the Bush series, you, you know, there, there was a lot of guys, you know, we, we were running with championship against Chad Little, mm -hmm. you know, love racing with him and, and, you know, a number of drivers. I mean, it was all pretty good. And, 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 and same with the, the cup and, and, you know, but when it, when it got really fun, I think is when I went to the truck series. Right, and that was a blast. I love running the trucks. They it, were so it, much fun. That was great yeah. because I, what I loved about the truck series and you guys running in it is that you had, you had the you had young and up and coming kids, you know, that were trying to make their mm -hmm. way. You know, you had your Kurt Bushes, your Carl Edwards, and those guys, but you also had 
you, you, your Hornadays, your Sprags, you, you know, your your Craftons, uh, um, you, you know, those veterans. You had a, you had Mike Skinner's. You, you know, you had the, you had the guys that you could go to for the wisdom and the knowledge, and then you also had the younger guys that were trying to make their way up uh, up the ladder in the business. And that's what I loved about it because, for you guys, you can still, it, for, I, I tell me if I'm wrong, it felt like it was fun because the pressure was off. Is it, it true? Is. <clears throat> yes. I, yeah, I wouldn't disagree with that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was just a side-by-side racing. And, and like I say, we had a bunch of us old ones in there, and then you have all these new new kids, and then everything in between. It's the most age difference in, in racing that, you know, that you see. And it was it was fun, you know, running. You know, Ron Hornady was a tough one to run with. You know, he's going to run into you. He's going to hit you. <laughs> We're going to side bump. We're going to do all those things. And, uh, and, and uh and then, at least for me, everybody else, it, it, we really didn't have a problem with. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a problem with them. I mean, it was just, that's the way it was. No, you've always been known and, for being a clean driver. I know that. Well, you try to. I mean, it's that's like, it. you know, from growing up, building all your own cars and all that stuff, it's like, if you wreck it, you're fixing it. Yeah. Well, I've always carried that, you know, around. I it, The first time I wrecked a car, when I moved down here, I was just in a huge panic. And they were like, oh, man, no, that was cool, man. We got another car. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, I said, that don't make any thinking, sense. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. But uh, do you think over the years uh, you were too nice on, on the track? Because uh, you know you've always been known for being a clean driver. But do you think that you know being a little more aggressive kind of would have gotten you more wins or 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 you know uh, you know really more wins and championships? Really? Um, yes and no. I meant there's there was probably. You know, I can only think of maybe a handful of races that I could have knocked somebody out right. running second. In but my dad and I and whatever, I don't believe in that. No, me I neither. Do not oh. believe in a bump and run. Mm. I I and it, and I know it's different today. And I know everybody. What whatever. I don't. That I was... always. You shouldn't touch them until you're beside them. Once you earn the right to be beside the guy and you rub a little bit. I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. Bump and run. My dad always told me, he goes, anybody can do that. Right. It's a, hey, no talent to knock somebody out of the way to pass them. Absolutely zero. It may take a little bit to make sure you're not in the same wreck. But mm-hmm. outside that, it uh, anybody can do that. So I, I do not. And I would... Um, still hate it when i see it oh i see nothing good on it i hate it too and i can't stand it and the problem is is that now it's become the norm and it is now we're now they're expecting it you, you know now when you you see a race especially a late model race the last lap i can almost guarantee you the leader's going to get moved you that's because they don't do anything about it well the whole <laughs> the other thing that drives me crazy is the whole rubbin's racing thing everyone's like oh rubbin's racing uh, that rubbing it, is racing. It, it, if you it, get, if you earn respect to get beside him and you're rubbing it, right. that's fine. But, mm-hmm. but not to, if he's in the same groove, you know the tracks wide. Now pick a different groove. Go around the outside of him. Do do what you got to do to get not not knock him out of the way. I and I'll probably more. Get yelled at for it. But it, it's like, but these, these guys have been around. They know not that that they don't they don't like it. The I fans, know. I guess the fans like it. And you know, I'm in the NASCAR thing is an entertainment business, so. I it, hate it's, it. I, oh, I do it too. drives me nuts. I mean, yeah. I, I see it in all levels too. I mean, I go to Bowman Gray, and you, you, you know, you, I've had it, it done to me. It, it have, oh yeah, it's, oh yeah, yeah. And that's the other thing too. Like people go, oh, Robin's race. I'm like, you know what? Get moved out of the way coming to the checkered flag, and then tell me how you feel about yeah. the bump and run. Exactly. You know, because <laughs> they, I, I hate the whole Robin's racing thing. That just, just, uh, just a thorn in my side. I argue with people on social media to no end about the whole thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Yeah, you know, we had Clyde McLeod on the show, and he's like. Well, what do you think about blocking? I said, I think blocking is bullshit too. He said, well, Partially, if yeah. you're, he goes, if you're holding a guy up for 50 laps, he goes, don't be surprised if he moves you. That I understand. It, you know, like. I, if the guy's running on the options, okay, the difference between blocking. See, I grew up in no radios or mirrors. Right. So I like that better. Um, now I do like the mirrors. And, and that it's just to give you a better surrounding of what's happening around you. You know, you can strategize your race better. If you see the guy's not catching you, you can slow down and save your stuff. But uh, without of it, you're, you're, you 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 just kind of run. And and same thing with spotters. I, I think the spotters are great um, on certain aspects. But I like how, like when I grew up, we didn't have any of that. 
mm-hmm. ASA, we had radios. And when I came back to Berlin, doing, then they had uh, what the, I call them pagers, but the... Receivers? Receivers. Okay. To where one person tells you where the wreck is and where debris is and things of that nature. I still love that. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's right for NASCAR to do that um, to a certain extent, but, you know, I was just listening to the Atlanta thing and they're just... I mean, nonstop talking. I mean, that drives me nuts when they talk to me on the radio. Uh. But I get why they do it. But in the same token, let the driver make some of these decisions. And, you know, they're using the help. They're using a tool that is gave to them. They, they, they are, I understand why they're doing it because that they're allowing that mm-hmm. to happen. But um, the blocking, like you say, I, I've ran into that with teammates before. They're, they're running blocking and, and I'm like, dude, you know, we're teammates here. Just let, let me go or whatever. Right. And, you know, so if they're blocking, if you're trying to get around a guy and you're working on trying to either pass from inside, outside, or whatever, with the blocking, that that does change your opportunities to do stuff. That's when people, you know, you say, well, give them the horn. Okay, I think back in the day, the guys would do it, but didn't spin them out. Right. Didn't wreck them. They just let them know, hey, I'm and, here. And, and and I've ran that with a the truck. So they beat on you for a little bit, and then I was like, all right, fine. Right. And, and go where today they don't they don't go up there and just bump 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 and give they don't give the guy in front of them an opportunity to move over for you right now it's just just like dump you and go i don't care and we, i don't like that we get a lot of young kids that watch the show too <clears throat> you know and impressionable drivers too so th- this is actually a great conversation to be having so because i i want some of the younger kids to be able to hear this and understand like the, the whole bump and run stuff like when you've gotten moved you said you, you just said you've gotten it done to you yeah okay what goes through your head besides i want to kill this guy <laughs> you know uh, when you get a bump and run pulled on you well there's nothing you can't do about it right you, you know you can be mad at the guy but i sure hope he did i meant i don't understand when it's a blatant blatant bump and run and then they're all excited in victory lane i said dude you, you didn't win that. right not not you did. You were the first one there, but you, yeah. But. Is it the sense of that a seasoned driver won't retaliate, but a young kid will? Yeah, because nobody's taught him any different. I mean, there's when you do that in a local level back in my day, or or work. You get back in my dad's area, you get the crap beat out of you if you did something <laughs> like that. So yeah. today, nobody teaches these kids. There's no repercussion. I know they'll pat you on the back for doing it. What well, now that. I know. No, you, that's wrong. One of the and, things that I have brought up to, especially at the short tracks, I, I said, you know, if, if you're going to have a situation where they're, they're going to spin the leader or dump the leader out of the way or, or move him out of the way in the last lap to win the race, I've always said you should make a rule. First and second get set to the rear. Third place gets the win. I I would, uh, that would stop it. You know, they, I mean, they, if they want to work their way into it, just make sure that guy didn't win. Put him second. Wherever he was running on time, if he was running second, Boom back spot. Okay, you already took it away from that guy. Give it to the guy running third. He didn't. He didn't. You know. But there's. It's. It's not a. There's a no win situation for that. Other than just policing it. Guy. Don't you think policing it would be would trying to teach the? Do you think policing it would teach these kids manners? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I mean, with the penalty, mm-hmm. you know, I even through NASCAR all the times I've been through there, they don't penalize the guy for wrecking you, but if you touch them, it's retaliation. Right. I always say it's a, it's a, it's like a bank robber going to rob the bank and a cop sh- shoots the robber. Well, it's a cop's fault. <laughs> no, he's the one that took your money. Right. That's no different than the guy's leading the race. The guy in second took your money. Mm-hmm. He wrecked you. Yeah, I get you. You know, so, and then if he does it to him, then it's retaliation. Mm-hmm. So you're better off to be the first person. This is why they get away with it. Because if I just wrecked a guy, nothing's going to happen. But if that guy touches me, it's retaliation. Yeah. That sucks. It's, it does. It, it shouldn't it, it be looked at that way. It makes zero sense. Right. It should be both involved, you know, tossed. Yeah. You know, that's it's, kind of the way that I look at it. Yeah. I mean, if a guy, it, and it's a bump and run, though, there's two different. If a guy's in there and he cuts you off, that's both your faults. Right. If he's just there and a guy just flat runs into you, right. that guy that's funny. There's absolutely nothing he did wrong. Right. No, absolutely. that I understand because even this past weekend, I was at a race where, you know, the, the kid that was going for the win, he was far enough inside he was to the driver's yeah. door and the other one on the outside kept coming down and you're at a point where you can't go any lower so yeah, it's that, like, that's part of racing and the guy being rude not giving you a lot of room I mean, right. your goal is to keep them tight the goal is not to run them off track though but mm-hmm. if you go in there and keep them too tight you got to expect something's coming because mm-hmm. if you run them on the apron 
he's going to move up. He's going to hit you. So I mean, I do understand. But the guy earned a right beside him. This is why that part's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't. I I am totally cool with like you know door rubbing and all yeah. that when you're side by side. Yeah, but when just when you just go in the corner and just flat hit somebody and send yeah. them up the track, I, I think that is just it's cheap shot. As Bones Borsier you should say, he said it's, it's it's a chicken shit move. It is. That's what he used to call it. Um, one of the one of the questions that we're posing to the guests that come in too, especially are the veterans because guys have been around a while is. Mm-hmm. What is the big push with getting all these young kids to the top levels of racing so quickly? I don't know. I, I mean, I came down and started my career down here and run my rookie year in Bush at 30 years old. I don't, so I would your age know. at 30 now, you're aged out. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I don't, you know, but they, they have to get that basic down. They have to understand the racing, but as a whole, the younger kids are causing most of the wrecks. Mm-hmm. Not, not, not in every case. Not, not when I'm talking like, you know, like Atlanta and Daytona and all that. That because that's bump bang race the whole time, anyways. Right. But anywhere else, they're, they're they're ones that are causing because they don't have the experience. They don't understand how to get out of it. They're going to learn, mm-hmm. um, but it, it's. Uh, I think when they start to learn too much in a higher level, it's just very expensive for everybody, mm-hmm. and and so. They just need somebody there to help them, and but the I think the mentality though with a lot of the the owners are like, well, I'd rather have them super aggressive than to teach somebody to go fast. I do agree with that to a certain extent, but if he's wrecking everybody every week or running into stuff or having problems, then eventually you got to say, hey, you know, you yeah. cost me a lot of stuff here. Yeah, but I don't I don't see that. I don't see people doing that now. Some of those drivers turn out to be great. And and someone won't, mm-hmm. but you can come in there and be clean the whole time, and still have a great guy, yeah. And not, you know, you're Jeff Gordon's and that you watch them rush about when they came down. They weren't wrecking people all the way, and they're some of the best in the sport, right? Mm-hmm. It can still be done today. It can. No, you're right. And there are still some kids that work on their stuff too, and and that's uh, one of the things that I I kind of find impressive lately because you know back in the day I used to be really impressed with a with a young kid that could wheel a race car, now. I'm to the point where I see a ton of young kids that can wheel a race car, but if you really want to impress me, set it up. Well, I think that's out of the hands of the drivers in today's world, but um, at, at the upper level, you know, but what I think has also made it worse is the cars that they have today by taking a power away. I know that's been a topic. You pretty much run wide open all the way around the track. Oh, yeah. That promotes the wrecks. Yeah. No, and I it know. doesn't promote great racing. It reminds me of when we there's no skill too because you're wide open the whole time. You just you're just turning the wheel. Yeah. I mean, and it doesn't. I, I mean, it takes skill. Don't get me wrong. Everybody that that makes it down there has got a lot of talent. Right, it does. Yeah, but, no, I get it. You know, but when you're running wide open, it it reminds me of uh, when us teams were wherever we are in the country and we take off, we get something to eat, and we go over to the go kart track. And we go into indoors, outdoors, or run the go karts, and we just beat the crap out of each other because it's fun. Right? You, know, you shouldn't do that in a professional side. You want to do that? Go to the go kart track, have some fun. Yeah. And and um, and that's how I view it. When you're when you're at the same speed and you're wide open, that's when stuff happens. Mm-hmm. And and um, but that shouldn't translate to Martinsville, Bristol, you, you know, Richmond. It, that shouldn't. It, it shouldn't even be in that category, but. At the tracks that you're virtually wide open all the time or just barely lifting, I very seldom ever raced track that way. We had more than enough horsepower and didn't have, mm-hmm. you know, so then the driver had to figure tire management. They had to, you know, figure out what what's, if I'm too loose, I can't get the power down. If I'm too tight, obviously it's going to slow me down. And, you had I to drive recover. it. You had to drive it. Right. Now they're still driving it, so don't don't people get a little messed up when you say you don't have to drive these new cars. You do. Right. But the only way you're going to pass somebody is if they have a problem or you hit them. Right, or you get a good run of momentum. You get a good run of momentum, mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of guys do a good job at that. Mm-hmm. Some don't, but um, but that's that's what causes it. It's just a constant beat and bang. And, it, and, and every one of those drivers will tell you, they, they do not like that. They don't like doing it because they are going to feel vulnerable that they cause a wreck. They sure as heck don't like it being done to them because it puts you in a bad position. Now, if it gets you to the front and you're going to lead, okay, you're going to accept that. But you don't want to do that until 15 to go, 15 laps to go or something. 
Well, we've had a, a bunch of guys on that have been crew chiefs and former drivers, and, and a lot of them were in agreement that if you raise the car up, uh, uh, raise the ride heights up a little bit, take sure. away the arrow, and give them a shitload of horsepower, <clears throat> it, it'll be, you know, the it'll be better racing. Why are they not trying that and still sticking with the arrow? I don't. I don't. That's a hard. That's a hard one here. I don't think it's going to create better racing. Because like you watch Atlanta, it was a wreck fest. Right. But it pervaded. It, it, the end was amazing. It was a great, it's still great race. And that's what, that's what people want to see. Mm -hmm. um, doing that, yes, I meant it. But I do see if they get in bad air, they're going to have to lift. But it's, you know, in a, in a, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. Because if you lift in a, in a track that you're running wide open, it's devastating. We've seen guys running second. He has shoved the nose and he's now he's 10th. If everybody's got to do that, all the way around the track, every lap, then they do stay a little closer together. The arrow is not going away. I don't care if you raise that car five inches, the arrow is not going away. Right. It, it's still there. We just didn't know we had it back in the day. Right. And so I don't think that that changes anything there. But they, I think they, <clears throat> I was uh, part of when they were trying to take all the horsepower of the trucks and they, we went down and did a test at Martinsville and so there's two of us there. We went out and ran and we're like, we're good. They kept working on their truck and kept working on it, kept working on it, kept working. They couldn't get it fast. And they're finally like, look, we have to which, do this which test. Team? I'm not going to say what teams are. Oh, okay. I'm gonna keep that out of it because they, they, they really don't have anything to do with the, the test. But it oh, was okay. this low horsepower engine thing. And now this is, this is back in like 08. And... Well, they go to start this. I was three quarters of a second faster than the other truck. And with the spec engine or the low horsepower? Just the low engine? horsepower stuff. Okay. And um and so we went out. Well, obviously gonna put him in front. So we ran fifteen laps. Now mind you, I'm three quarters of a second faster than him. Couldn't pass him. Not without hitting him or wrecking him. Okay. I can't pass him. Mm -hmm. Can't pass them. Can't pass them. Can't pass them. And uh, they, after we run that fifteen laps, they said switch. So we switched. In two and a half laps, I was born a straightaway lead. Okay. Well, this is why I don't like non horsepower. <laughs> and I and I and you know the people there. He says, "Hey, I says you've run, uh, uh, wheel and modified cars back mm -hmm. in the day." Mm -hmm. I said, "That's what you ran." I go, over horsepowered, under tired. You guys are always spinning wheels. And I says, that's what gave you an opportunity to pass somebody. I says, this is not going to promote that. The vehicle is too heavy. Yeah. And and they didn't end up doing it, but the but it was like I could have spent the entire day. He could have we could have run two hundred laps. I'd have never passed him. Really? Just just in the way or just just too hard to do it at Martinsville you, because you couldn't get a run on him? You couldn't get a run on him, you couldn't because he can't make a mistake. You know, he'd go in the corner. Yeah, you had to lift, but he could. Once you you could slam it right to the floor. You'll never spin the tires. Okay. So he'll never slip coming off the corner. Gotcha. Well, because I don't have that power, he's you can kill the momentum a little bit. You never get a run on him. No kidding. And, okay. and we, I meant like I say, we spent an entire day testing there. And like I say, we were three quarters of a second faster, and I couldn't pass him. Wow. We we're in fifteen laps. You know, he's a good driver. He wasn't blocking me. He wasn't right. doing anything. He just. He just ran the groove, and I couldn't do a thing about it. No kidding. So, uh, so right about right now, like, what do you, what is a, what is a, a regular day for you involved? Are you, is there any type of racing for you involved? Or are you officially like retired and enjoying life? Well, there I'm gonna, I'm gonna run a handful of races with the Super this year again. But this is the last. I said this last year, but, <laughs> um, but we wrecked one of the cars last year, and, and it wasn't as good a year as we wanted. So, um, so I'm gonna run. We're not running the full season. Okay. And but like a normal day, um, you know, I still got all my machinery and stuff like that. So I get people come over want something machined. I'll do it. Um, I build a lot of plumbing racks for a, a particular company down in uh, um, down in Charlotte or Cornelius there. That every new truck they get, I, I build the racks for them. Just really? for, just for something to do. Okay. And and you still like fabricating and building. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But I choose what I do. Okay. Somebody come over and want to do something. I go, nah. If it's cool, I'll do it. Okay. If it's, if it's a standard issue, now if they're a friend, I'll do it. Obviously, but 
Is there anything that you want to try, Ray? Besides the Super, obviously, is there anything like you want to try playing with? I mean, because we're seeing Newman and Labani and, you know, a bunch of the, 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 the old Cup guys, they're going and playing around in the Modifieds. Uh, they're running those tour-type cars. and I've never and, driven one of those. I think yeah. that'd be cool to do it. That would be cool. I know, I know Bobby enough. I should ask him. But, uh, <laughs> and, and it, you know, I, you've driven a Super. I mean, you a, super, um, a regular Modified's got to be, you know, yeah. nothing. <clears throat> I, I was trying to get him to run a Super once, and then... Uh, he goes, if you ever go test, let me know. And so Bobby did? Yeah. Oh, with the super? But he's like, I don't think he wants to race it. He just wants to try it, right? And so I was, uh, so what? maybe when we get ready to t uh, test, I'll probably call him. Because la last year, we didn't end up. Because I called him. I go, hey, we might run over here and test what well, didn't happen. And um, so we're trying to do that. Because we do have a race uh, down here with the supers in, in November at Caraway. Yeah. So that's going to be fun. I'm going to be calling that race. And yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, so I'm, I'm, gonna, look, I'm looking forward to that but um but yeah so it's just the i think this is gonna be it just i'm getting too old to go that fast <laughs> you know but uh but it is it's such a great sport great people it reminds me of like how asa was if, if there was a problem mm -hmm. somebody's gonna help you mm -hmm. you know you i mean everybody helps everybody in garage area that's what i love about mm -hmm. uh isma and the supers because that's it's all family it's all like when i started that mm -hmm. reminds me of what it is Everybody's there to be competitive to win. That never changes. But um, but yeah, you walk around, talk to people. You know, it was part. Of the, I think the like the last couple of years I was in the cup, you weren't like allowed to go talk to other crew members or other crew members weren't. And that it's like it's not like you're going to sit there and spill stuff. Now some people may, but I know. No, but it, it, I, I worked just, for NASCAR for twelve years. I worked for NASCAR for twelve years. It's definitely a different environment. It's a it's a more business. It's more corporate. Uh, it's and it know, is. It's it's exactly what it is. Right, it, yeah. and um, I, I'm assuming that kind of was not fun as far as the the racing aspect of it, like trying to find deals for rides and all all of that stuff. Because what was it? You uh, you bought out your last two years of your contract at Roush, right? I did there. That was just things weren't necessarily in the direction they were supposed to go. I mean, I, I went to. When I went there, I, didn't, I was not in uh, the team in the car I was supposed to that I agreed to sign up with. So that was just never easy to to deal with that. So I, I just chose to go somewhere else. So there's... Um, and that so must have been have frustrating that. because Roush was... They were on the rise. I mean, they had they had uh, oh, uh, you know Mark Martin. Team. They had uh, yeah. Kenseth, and and yeah. yeah, that was when you had what Chad Little and you and Musgrave were, were yep. part of it. Yeah, there was five of us. Yeah, yeah. five car team. Yeah, but I felt two cars. Well, I know, but mm -hmm. two cars got anything, everything that they needed with the with all the wind tunnels and all that stuff. We didn't have that. Now we do we have the same opportunity of car stuff. Yes, but. But when it come to you know your bodies and all that other stuff, it was just a it was just a different uh, different scenario. That like I say, that's why I liked where I was at with the thirty, and that's why I liked where I was at the ten. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you and James Ince just were were magical together. You guys just had that chemistry, I guess. Is, is well, that James what it was is? smart. We had a lot of great people there, mm -hmm. and you know. But like like I say, when I was with the thirty, uh, Doug Hewitt, same way. I mean, he came from the modified uh, tour type cars mm -hmm. back in the day. Yep. Loved work with him. He. We, we worked we, with Gary Putnam too, who yep, also came Gary from the Putnam modifieds and, and things of that nature. And we we had that same language, and then I had that with uh, uh, with James too, and and it and the people underneath us that were there. Mm. Um, it felt like you were Saturday night racing, just at a higher level. But you didn't meetings ain't taking three four hours. You could you could explain what you wanted in a car, and they could achieve that mm -hmm. fairly quick. And and uh, I I like teams like that. Right, yeah. and it seemed like you guys hit a really good stride with that Valvoline 10 car. Too. Yeah, we did. We were I really mean, good. I, I honestly think you guys should have had way more wins, you know, especially yeah, I agree. at Daytona when yeah. you guys first came out for that one. But uh, that was a huge shock. That was so cool, the 2000 Daytona 500, oh, yeah. because you were the, the It was underdog. up until the end. <laughs> yeah, I know. God, I know, of all things. But it, but it was still a great run. Do you wish that you'd have blocked Dale a, a little more coming off of two? Well, we hit. That's where the problem was. Okay. And then I got loose, and it, it uh, even her hurt come down. And he goes, "Man, I would have run him into the infield lake." <laughs> and I go, "Well, the problem was I was about to spin, and if I would have, if I would have tried to stay in front of him because he just barely was on me, mm -hmm. and 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 back then you run him loose enough that you could stick your hand out and spin him. So, 
uh, between the air starting to get me in the bump, I was like, if I tried to stay there, I was going to the infield. Mm -hmm. I was going to wreck. Mm -hmm. And so I had to, I had to manipulate the car over a little bit, which at that point in time, got beside me, I was toast. The cars would also yeah. like get weird off it too, right? Wouldn't they? Oh, Flatten absolutely. out or something coming off? They, they would, but it was, I should have covered, I was trying to block, I were blocked, trying to keep them from getting it run. And, but as I come down, he already got there before I did. I should have came down earlier. Mm -hmm. And, but I really thought he was going to the outside. I made a mistake there. But then as I come down, he run into me, which he's being pushed. He, now in those scenarios, he, he was not doing a dump and run. Right. He, you know, it was just, um, no, he if had I were behind him too, yeah, if I would have got in front of him, he would have ran into me and we would have kept going, but I wasn't all the way in front of him and he, he got me loose. So I had to turn right. Mm -hmm. It was either go the infield <laughs> spinning out or turn right just a little bit. Well, oh. I caught it, but by then it already opened up the door. So it was, uh, right. Um, Dale would have kept turning left. He said he would have run him in the infield. Well, that was that was Jarrett that did that. <laughs> no, uh, Earnhardt, I said. But Earnhardt said, man, I would have run him into the infield. Like, oh, oh well. God. I, I says, well, he already had a hold of me, though, and I was already loose. And he goes, oh, I didn't see that. Uh, he, he just, you know, I says, no, no, we had already made right. a slight contact, and I would, I had to turn right to save the car. Do you have any, you have any fun uh, Earnhardt stories? It seems like uh, everybody's got uh, some that they've shared with us. Um, well, just when, uh, when I was still working at home, he, he, he was part of the move, how he made it down here. Cause he had called, wanted me to run when I was running ASA, he wanted me to run his car at Dover. Oh, really? And a Bush car. Okay. And so they started working on that. Well, then AC Delco basically told, uh, Dale that he had to run the race. He couldn't not run it. Well, I don't, I don't remember what he was in the points. I think in, in, you know, Dover's very demanding racetrack back then still is, but, um, but that was the old asphalt. And so they were, they wouldn't let him not run the race. Okay. And then, so with his connection with Chevrolet and some of minus and that, whatever, um, he worked it out and I ended up running a race with Ernie Irvin. Okay. So it did. That's kind of how it started. So that's like story with Dale. But at Michigan, uh, though, that was your first Bush race, right? Ended up being at Michigan, yes. Okay. And and so it was. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I, th I thought. I was funny. Like Ernie, you drove for Ernie Irvin. I did. And, okay. Which and the car was sponsored by AC Delco too, right? It was. So which, this was all. <laughs> part. And ASA also had the AC Delco sponsorship too. So yes. Okay. Yeah. So the kind of like then, was the a pairing. And one of my big sponsors I've had my entire career has been uh, Berger Chevrolet. So there's where the part of the Chevrolet thing that helped. Okay. And so, I mean, he's, they, that company sponsored my dad. They sponsored me through all of my stuff, my dirt car stuff, my outlaw late models, ASA car. Um, and then not, not so much a NASCAR, I meant a lot of support there and I'd put it on a suit if I could. And then of course, when I um, run into super, they sponsored a super or when I had my late models, they, mm -hmm. Berger Chevrolet is always uh Matt Berger's always been a great, great uh, supporter, and and I support him 100%. He's got a great dealership and that's cool. That's things good. of that nature. So hey, plug away. Believe me, that's yeah. why we're here. You know, if you got something, there's, to plug. One, there's one sponsor I can say <laughs> that I've had my entire career. That's cool. And and um, they they've done a t tremendous amount, and I and I think it, the re the return to him I think has been pretty 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 good too. Cool. We're getting closer to the end of the show, but uh, we did want to just chat about a few more things. Uh, you brought some pictures here, which I thought were really cool. We're, we're gonna edit they're not the, cool, but we're gonna these, well, yeah, <laughs> they're not. But we're gonna edit these into the show for sure. But this was your super modified wreck and fire at yes. Berlin, right? Yeah. Uh, like, all right, you explain the story of how this whole thing had happened because. This was also right around the time you had won the truck championship, and I remember it was Fo right after. Right, yeah. I remember Fox Sports doing a pre-race show with talking about how you know this wreck and uh, you getting hurt. Um, what what happened that night? Well, the car was just so extremely fast. I mean, we were like, holy crap, fast, and I was I was basically impatient. You know, at least it was, but and it was just a matter of just going down. A, a car got loose, and I had. Um, I was going by him at a fairly good clip, and uh, and his right rear hit my left rear, and not any of his fault. I mean, this was it. Just, it just just happened. It was in uh, is my you know everybody would say, well, if you weren't in a hurry, I go, I wasn't really in a hurry. His car was just that fast, 
and but that could have happened at any moment mm -hmm. doesn't matter if you if you've gotten a wreck if you weren't there it wouldn't have happened mm -hmm. so <laughs> it's a it the racing stuff's going to happen and this one did but it was an extremely extremely um bad hit i mean i had a um computer thing on there for Rex and it was it, the number was it flatlined it at 100 G's and uh really even NASCAR came over um or the safety guy I can't think of his name off the top of my head now but uh, they came over and looked at the car and he took that data and, and wanted to see it wow. and you and had I, a black box in the suit in the car I mean, yeah kind, yeah it was kind of like that kind of like that and uh wow. they, so they were able to read the data but the problem is that it it flatlined at a hundred, it didn't go any higher than that, so they don't, they can't even estimate what it was. But I mean, it broke the engine on the car. It, um, it did so much stuff. I broke like all of my ribs on my left side, both my collarbones, broke my wrist, <clears throat> um, uh, destroyed my shoulder, and and then uh, I bleed now this year. Had back concussion. It and burnt, burnt my arm pretty good, but because um, you would, so you would a, hit. With the left side, I of the went car. left side. Yeah, right. You pancaked yeah. essentially, right? Yeah. And the fuel cells on the left side of those cars too, right? There's there's one there and then one behind me. And actually, the left side one actually made it through the wreck. That ripped the rear one out of the car, which I was shocked because I, had, although they're small bolts, but it's it's squished between the frame there, and it had 32 bolts holding it in there, and it it, it blew it right out of the car because it was full of fuel. Wow. But, um, you know, so a couple surgeries, get you all patched up, ready to go. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> it's still, wow. you know, but I, okay. but I was lucky. I, w I was definitely lucky on that. And right. Um, well, this, let me ask you, this was not a fuel fire though, because methanol usually both. burns blue, right? It's both. It's both um, fuel and oil. Yeah, fuel and oil. Cause uh, um, that, my arm got burnt. And, I, and that's, that's, I think, as I got soaked with fuel. And so it, before the suit got an opportunity to close up, it started burning underneath me, which is really weird because it uh, apparently it was still on fire, and somebody just dumped water on it because that methanol you just pour water on it goes away. But it um, so it must have saturated my suit before the suit got hot enough to close up, and because there's different styles of suits, and and wow. so I burnt my arm pretty good. But uh, but yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it's oil, and then right. but they they empty seven or eight fire extinguishers on it before they got the water truck because the methanol was still burning. Wow. But, um, yeah, and I've always complained. I said, look, we got methanol there. Just bring water truck. You don't need fire extinguisher. Right. And. Holy cow. So it was, it was, it was, a. Uh, that part took a little bit of fun out of the race. I was going to say, this is big. Was this, <laughs> was this uh, the, the most injured you've ever been in a car? Oh, by far. Oh, it was. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Is it, it, it kept me out about, Five months. Wow. Okay. Now, was it was a, the was any part of the car salvageable, or was it all junk? I mean, part of it actually. The front clip wasn't bad, but the rest of the car was uh, junk. But um, we did save the engine. I mean, it broke the block on it, but we fixed the block. Um, it had to weld the heads up and stuff like that, so that was able to get out of it. And then the front clip actually made it through because I actually put that under the race car <laughs> with oh, I really? run with after about five years. And uh, but everything else is not good. Wow, that is just amazing. I mean, it was crazy. It crazy has rip. been, it, it's been some amazing stories that you've been sharing with us, and we're definitely going to get some shots of these photos for sure. I only brought them. That's the first time I ever brought them because everybody always asks about it. I no, go, we definitely we're going to yeah. use them. We we definitely want to include it's, them into the show. But uh, we definitely had a lot of fun talking with you today. Oh, so I hope you had a lot of fun. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, we ask uh, all of our guests, would you come back and do it again? Oh, absolutely. Okay, cool. Oh, one other question before we go, and we've been asking this to a lot of the guests. We asked this to Todd and, and some others: is longevity in the sport. And if there's anyone that has definitely proven that, it has been you. Because like we said earlier, like you've had both a great first and second half uh, uh, of your your racing career. I mean, the beginning with all the success in ASA and the Bush Series, and then you had your Cup career and then a championship in, in both the Bush and the Truck Series. What do, what do people do or need to do to keep that longevity in this sport lately? Because we are seeing that it is harder and harder to stay in the sport. It, it's just a choice. You know, I think when people, 
I don't think that really the the guys get burned out more probably on travel than racing because I, I I don't think I'd ever get burned out on racing, but I'm probably one of the not smarters to keep doing it. Where these guys are smart enough to walk away, but you know health wise I'm still in pretty good shape. I don't I, all the stuff that I've broken is bad wrecks. I don't really have any um, effects. Okay, I don't, nothing bothers me. Okay, so, okay. and and so you're able to go do that, but the you know but why I think that. The goal originally was if I quit doing that, which I did for quite a while, is go back to my home track and race. And I did that. I uh, but I did that throughout racing. I didn't, you know, where Carl Larson that they go do all the sprint car. I did the same thing. I just went to my home track. Okay. And I think that I think some of the guys it would be great if the guys did that while they're racing. And now I know contracts does permit a lot of that. I get that part of it. But like afterwards, go do that because the fans one they love it. Um, it does draw a lot of people. When I go to Berlin, a lot of people show up. And, you know, that's the good part for me is I could go there and I go race. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the old fans come back out. That's good for the racetrack. That keeps the racetracks, the grassroots, we'll call them, whatever you want to call them. It, it helps them. I mean, they helped you get to where you're going. So I always went back and try to help them stay that part too. Or go help some of these young kids and get them through that there's a lot of great racers out there so i'm gonna some of the kids i think that come in didn't really grow up in a racing scenario like we did mm -hmm. right and and you know if their dad raced or if they're and they're really good at what they do they've got a good uh, a good teacher but some of these don't have that they don't have that background to teach them these certain things that go through there and i think a lot of drivers could go do that but i think that some of the you know, like cup drivers that have the opportunity to do that, they got paid so much, they don't have to do it. Mm. You have to want to do it because they don't have a lot of money to pay you. And so it's just a matter of what you want to do afterwards. And I chose to do, um, to be part of racing in some aspect on a grassroots level. Do you, do you think we're not cultivating enough local heroes anymore? Because we, we've had, you know, journalists on the show and they've said to me like, very few of these kids are interested in being a local hero anymore. They win a race at their local track and then they're off in a series somewhere and we're not really learning much about them because there's no backstory. We're witnessing the backstory. No, I think that um, the advantage I had, I was able to do that. I think that, I, I still believe this, that if somebody wants to go and they get in a, an opportunity where they can get to these tracks way younger than I could, um, is to go to the local track, but pick a hard one and pick a good one. Mm -hmm. One that's very competitive, uh, track that's demanding to do, and you learn there until you figure it out. Mm -hmm. You run there until you win a, win a championship, then move forward. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't. Some people think there's not time for that. I, I disagree to a certain extent. But, um, but you know, I started racing at 19. Well, now these these kids can start racing at these local tracks at 12. I know. You know, so I started at 19. I spent five, six years doing that. There and then and maybe four years before I went to ASA. Then stay there four or five years. Yeah. They don't yeah. need to be they don't need to be 18 when they come down here. Now, if they have the funding to do it, they're going to do it. Yeah. No, I, I saw a video where they put a nine-year-old in a dirt leap model last week somewhere on <clears> some track in Tennessee. I saw that. Oh, oh, I saw one down in Florida. I thought it was cool. <laughs> nine, nine years old, though, in a dirt late model. I mean, the kid that won at the dirt track was 11. Yeah. Uh, you know, that short track national. Like, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's insane to do that. I mean, it, we always always heard the story of Jeff Gordon running a sprint car at 12, 13 years old. Yeah. Okay. But that isn't, he didn't start in that. Yeah. He ran stuff since way young. And, and I think that's where... If they want to run go my dad wouldn't let me race go karts. Thought they're too dangerous, so really? I started out in a full blown outlaw late model <laughs> at a local track though. Okay, not travel in the country. Right, right. And he made me run. I hated that track. He made me run there until I started winning every week at Berlin. No, this yeah. at dirt track. At oh, at dirt track. Right. in Muskegon, at Thunderbird right. Speedway, and we had another dirt track that I loved. Well, because I liked it, yeah. he wouldn't let me run there. He would. He wanted me to run the other track, which was a little harder. But because I didn't like it, because it was a challenge. 
Well, because it, it, it not only did you have to get off the anger part of being there <laughs> and run good, <laughs> but it taught you patience. Look, you hate being there. You, you, you know what I mean? It taught me. I, I look back and laugh because in because he finally told me he goes, "Oh no, because you didn't like track and made you run there. <laughs> he wanted but you to be it, happy." <laughs> but it was hard, and they had great. It teaches you discipline faster, right? I gotcha. You know, because there was a point in time that you go, "I've got to run here. I hate coming here." <laughs> And then, I, and then I thought, okay, this is not healthy to hate this place. So, because uh, the fans were awesome, I right. mean, I, I just didn't like trap. And so I had to get over that and learn how to be, beat the system and get better and r- run fast and beat the guys, which I was able to accomplish. And then I got to the point that I started enjoying a track, and then I like to go there. Then my dad says, go somewhere else, okay? Because I figured the track out. So he's like. All right, now let's go find another a track that's a little harder for you. And at that point in time, I've um, I don't care what track it is. I don't I don't dislike any racetrack. But um, so, but that was part of the lesson too. Okay, you know you can't go into a place that you absolutely hate because you'll never do good. Okay, so it was just getting over that part of like, all right, I can't. We're gonna run here apparently. So I just figured it out. Okay, that's cool. That yeah, it, it, real quick too. I know I keep saying we're gonna uh, let you go, but uh, <laughs> the, I'm good uh, all night. Okay, cool. <laughs> the uh, you know the outlaw late models is one of the things that you you love doing. Did you ever try doing those uh, world speed records that the Bozells do at Kalamazoo, where they put the big big <laughs> panels up on the side of the car? Did you ever try doing that? I did, did not. You? It oh, um that is it's it's freaking insane. insane. Holy shit, that's insane. But that's a special built car. Is that what that he is? Did, he okay. didn't take his regular car and do that. Oh, all there, right. There's a lot that goes into that. And okay. I thought about it, and then I was like, there's no return on this. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there was like, no like, return on it's this. It's a 700 horsepower, 800 horsepower motor or oh, something like that. More than that. It's more than yeah. that, okay. And, and they've got these giant wing sideboards. sideboards that look like a slot car, for, for God's sake. Well, I, I will tell you that I've, I've raced Kalamazoo, and I've won a lot of races down there. Mm-hmm. And if you ran on good tires. Now, I ran there when they run a, a treaded-type tire and stuff, too. But um, a good tire, if you ran a, a 1250, you can be fast time. Andy started running around there in what nine point seven seconds or nine point four seconds? <laughs> nine seconds. You, you know, it's just insane. I mean, that's a oh, that would be the one thing that I don't think a super could beat. Right. That that the super would not go around that track in nine seconds. But I, um, I saw Pearly, I saw Chris Pearly set a one lap five eighths of a mile world record at Flemington one year uh, in his super, but. They he had like four gum they put like four soft gumballs oh, out yeah, there. Yeah. It was they were doing yeah. you know speed runs, and they put soft tires on there and they pushed him off, and he went out and the wing dropped and it never picked up for like four laps and they after everything was done it was like a hundred and fifty six mile an hour average or, or something like oh, that. Oh yeah, that surprised me. Yeah, <laughs> not yeah. Well, hell, I mean, uh, qualifying for the Oswego Classic was up around the 150s a couple of years ago, uh, you know, when I was doing the, the race at uh, uh, Speed Sport. But yeah, just, and then, <laughs> like the wing cars, how, how fast they go around, they're still a couple of seconds faster. It's just, uh, I mean, it, I don't know. It's, I, I love racing. It doesn't matter what it is. And, right. Um, I think that as you, like I've gone to a bunch of drag races. Mm-hmm. And at first, and, and it's been years ago when I did my first one, I didn't even care about it. Mm-hmm. And the first time I went, I was like, oh, my gosh. I said, didn't, you know, you, TV doesn't show that the cool part of that sport. Yeah. And it, it, it don't matter what sport you're at in motor racing. It, their challenges are there and they're huge. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think most people like that. And I, <laughs> although I still laugh today, I should become a crew chief because I think the crew chiefs actually got a better spot than anybody now because they got a long, longer longevity into the sport yeah, than what a driver right. does. But, um, it, uh, but it's a lot harder work for them, too. It is for everybody. Well, hope you had fun today. Absolutely. I really do. I Great hope you time. had a good time today. Thank you for coming yeah. in, really. Thank this you. was a lot of fun. We appreciate it. Johnny Benson joins us on the Derek Pernasiglio Show. We want to thank him for coming in. We had a really great time with him. And remember to follow us on our YouTube channel at the Derek Pernasiglio Show. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and on TikTok at Real DP Show. And then, of course, keep up with us on our Facebook page as well at the, at uh, Derek the, the Derek Pernasiglio Show. I'll get those words out and those plugs out. But yeah, definitely want to thank Johnny Benson for coming in. And as always, we'll see you the next time. Bye.